and welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center Livable Communities webinar. Today's webinar is titled, ITE Recommended Practices on Accommodating Pedestrians and Bicyclists at Interchanges, and we will be speaking with Matthew Ridgway, Principal at Fair and Piers, Megan Mintman, Senior Associate at, Be at Fair and Piers, and Mariana Pajaya, Senior Transportation Planner slash Engineer with Fair and Piers. My name is James Gallagher, and I am the PBIC Communications Manager. I will be facilitating today's webinar. I'd first like to say hello to today's speakers to make sure they are ready and that everyone can hear them. Matthew, are you there? Yep, I'm here, James. And Megan and Mariana, do we have you on the line as well? Yep, we're both here. We're here. Before we get started with today's webinar, I want to go over a few administrative details and the functionality of the webinar software. If for some reason your computer or web browser freezes during the webinar, please reload the website and log back into the program you will be able to rejoin the session. Please note that attendees will not be able to speak during the webinar. We do expect a large number of attendees in this call, and by muting your audio, it helps us to cut down on confusion and background noise. As an attendee, you have a control box in the upper right corner of your screen that collapses and expands by clicking the double arrows. If you're not able to speak, you do have the ability to ask questions by entering them in the question box. If you have a problem during the webinar, you may enter it here. I will monitor these questions and respond to you if I am able. Questions pertaining to the presentation may be asked at any time in the question box, but they will not be addressed until the end of the program when we have built in about 20 minutes for discussion period. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along. We will try to get to them after the presentation. When you exit the webinar, there is a brief survey that will pop up. We would very much appreciate your feedback on our performance. Within the week following today's webinar, you will receive a follow-up email from the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. Please do not delete that email. That email will include a link to download a printable certificate of attendance for one and a half hours of instruction. If there are multiple attendees at your site, please forward this link to the other participants so that they can download and print the certificate with their name. This webinar has been approved by AICP for one and a half CM credits. The Road Safety Academy, the training and education arm of the UNC Highway Safety Research Center, is a registered provider of CM credits. For more information on the Road Safety Academy, please visit www.rsa.unc.edu. For more information on future webinars or to view the archives from this webinar series and others, please visit www.walkinginfo.org slash webinars. You can also stay abreast of PBIC webinars by liking us on Facebook at facebook.com slash petbike. In addition to these webinars, PVIC offers four different in-person training courses to provide technical assistance to professionals and community members in developing pedestrian safety action plans and in improving walking conditions uh, and in improving conditions for walking. I'm sorry. These courses can be found at www.walkinginfo.org slash training. Uh, now I'd like to welcome and thank Matthew, Megan, and Mariana for their presentation today. We'll take questions at the end. Matthew, please take it from here. Thanks, James. Uh, and thanks to all those who could tune in today. Um, so I am Matthew Ridgeway. I'm a principal with Fair and Peers, as, as James said, and I was the chair of the ITE uh, Pedestrian and Bicycle Council for uh, three years and the vice chair, actually, for six years before that. And, um, uh, this was one of the key projects that we decided to do as, as part of that council. And let me say a little bit about ITE as well. So ITE stands for the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Uh, it's the largest professional organization of transportation professionals, at least in the U.S. and possibly in the world. Um, uh, as I said, I was a member of that and still a member of the executive committee of that group, uh, but was the chair. Megan is currently the vice chair uh, of that group, uh, also a member of the TRB pedestrian committee. Uh, and so Megan and I have really been facilitators uh, of, of the content that you're going to see today. Um, uh, and I'll describe it, as I describe the process through which we derived these this content. You'll see that it really is a facilitation. This isn't necessarily our bent. Or, uh, this is really a, a, us taking a whole host of experts and uh, and trying to collate what they have down to in something that, that makes sense. Mariana uh, is a senior transportation planner engineer in our uh, San Francisco office, who's also been active in ITE and, has, and has, quite frankly has done the bulk of the legwork of late, especially. Um, uh, on on bringing about the, the overall um, recommended practice that's coming about. So there are four sections of this of this presentation that we're going to get to today. Uh, they um, 
and I think the presentation as a whole will, will take about 55 to 60 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, I'll be doing the background and the guiding principles. Uh, then Megan will be talking about the crosswalk treatments. Uh, and then Mariana will be going into the actual interchange uh, cases. Uh, so let's jump right into the, the background. Uh, uh, when I was chair of the ITE Petbutt Council, one of the things we did at, at one of our uh, uh, meetings was to ask ourselves through a workshop process what were the most important issues that we thought were coming up within the ped bike realm that weren't already addressed uh, by some other publication. Uh, accommodated bicycles and pedestrians at interchanges ended up being, uh, it wasn't the, the top, it was maybe the second highest category of all the things that, that came up that we really thought that was inadequate guidance about how to accommodate bicycles and pedestrians at interchanges. Some of that may, some context on that is that ITE, in addition to being the largest, is primarily an organization uh, of uh, practitioners, of people who are working in the field, who are public or private sector, uh, hands on the ground, uh, sort of implementing transportation solutions. Uh, and so uh, we tend to have a little less influence from academia than, say, does the TRB and those types of organizations. And so it makes sense that this is a group of people who are actually in the practice of designing interchanges and intersections and, and wanted to have this type of guidance. The process that we then used to do it uh, was actually a workshop process. So uh, we took what was normally our business meetings uh, for five separate meetings, uh, and instead of holding our regular business meetings there, we held them on the phone before uh, the annual meetings and other meetings, uh, and then at the actual uh, get-together uh, at the annual meetings and so forth. We held, held these workshops and uh, first talked in general terms about what are our guiding principles, what are we trying to achieve, and then talk more specifically about how do we deal with on-ramps, how do we deal with off-ramps. Um, and then how do we do, you'll see there's another case later on for single point urban interchanges. It took about a two and a half years. It included um, uh, meetings in Anaheim, which was an ITE meeting, quite interesting because we really had almost a shouting match between uh, a, a gentleman who was from the city of Anaheim. I don't know if he worked for the city or just lived in Anaheim, uh, whose perspective was that the accommodation for bikes and interchanges is to put up a sign that says bike lane ends here. Uh, we also had meetings in Seattle. We had two in Washington, D.C. as part of the Transportation Research Board meetings, and we had one in San Antonio. Our initial intent was to then take this and write it all up into what ITE calls an informational report. Uh, the process for publishing an informational report is a lot simpler than the process for publishing a recommended practice. In, in point of fact, what happened was that we, we got done with our recommendations, and ITE staff came back and said, it actually looks a lot more like a recommended practice than it does an informational report. We think you should take it through that process, um, which is one of the reasons it's taken two and a half years. Uh, so we're now in that process, which is quite rigorous. Um, we have had uh, a draft that has been uh, reviewed by a, a whole bunch of collaborators uh, who include uh, John LaPlante, uh, Beverly Kuhn, Dwight Kingsbury, Rock Miller, and Eddie Barrios. Uh, we've also then uh, published a, another draft as a result of those uh, comments and input we've received from that group. Uh, and that draft has been reviewed by a formal uh, recommended practice review panel for ITE. And that panel has consisted of Peter Kuntz, Michelle Danilla, uh, Kevin Dunn, Sheila Lyons, and Ken Putman, Putnam. Excuse me. Uh, and after we get done responding to their comments, this will then go out as a draft recommended practice, and it will be published on the ITE webpage, available for free download from anybody. And therefore, I believe three months, maybe a little more, uh, for anybody to download and comment on, and it's only after it survived that process that it might um, become a recommended practice. It reminds me of that that little segment that used to happen during cartoons. I'm just a bill. I'm only a bill. I'm sitting here in Capitol. Anyways, uh, I won't go into that anymore. Um, we did have a couple of, um, oh, I'm sorry, one other acknowledgement is that Lisa Fontana Tierney has been our IT representative on this, and she's been really great about so, so steering us and giving us good direction on this, so I want to acknowledge her. One of the fundamental things we decided at the front end of this is that um, we wanted to adhere to national best practices. We wanted this to be a document that was useful to state DOT representatives uh, uh, because those are the primary people involved in the design uh, of interchanges. Uh, and, as, and those people, uh, state DOTs primarily, and I don't mean to say those people in a bad way, sorry, I'll stop saying that, uh, people who work for state DOTs tend to want to adhere to state DOT best practices. Uh, and those are prescribed by either AASHTO or uh, local versions of AASHTO or the Manual of, Uni Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices and then also the AASHTO Biocide, which is obviously newly published. Um, 
And so we wanted to make a, a, a guide that was useful for practitioners uh, in that context. Uh, and that, that has been a constraint, uh, especially in the, with the advent of the National Association of City Traffic Officials Bike Guide, NACTO Bike Guide, um, which pilots a whole bunch of additional uh, concepts and ideas, uh, many of which can be incorporated. But they're not necessarily counter to national best practice, uh, sort of ASHTO, MUTCD type of documents. Um, but there are dirt, certainly some treatments within uh, NACTO and other, other guides uh, which are not currently accepted for practice uh, uh, at, at, the, at the national level, at the state DOT level for most states. Uh, so that's a constraint. Uh, it's sort of a choice and consequence that, that we have as part of this. Uh, and so during the course of, especially when um, Mariana is talking about the um, interchange options, uh, you'll, you'll hear a lot of conversation about this is not necessarily the best case scenario for cyclists. It's not everything we could achieve, but within the context of, of an interchange and within this geometric configuration, this is what we, we were able to achieve. We'll also talk a lot about a level of traffic stress during the course of this presentation, uh, which is a Mineta Institute um, LTS. If you haven't seen it, it's a pretty good publication. Uh, just as a way to put in context what we're able to achieve in terms of reducing level of stress for cyclists in particular, uh, and then also acknowledge where it is that we haven't been able to achieve um, so the sort of 8 to 80 type cyclist experience um, because of uh, the constraints that we've, we've added, that we as a group, as a panel, all decided uh, should be put on this in terms of adhering to national best practices. In terms of a problem statement, um, uh, they are, uh, there are three primary problem statements. One was to enhance pedestrian and bicycle safety. Uh, the second one was to connect pedestrian and bicycle facilities efficiently with surrounding land uses. Uh, some of that also relates to making them more con uh, closer to one another by making interchanges smaller, as we'll see in a later slide. And, we, and the last um, problem statement was to provide a consistent message um, uh, about when it is uh, a vehicle has exited the freeway environment uh, and now on a local street environment. Uh, and the, the last thing is, uh, the, the last point is one that we, you'll also see pop up throughout the course of this conversation, uh, as we, we really do think that one of the things we've done historically uh, is to almost continue the freeway environment into the adjacent to in, arter, interchange uh, arterial systems, and as a result, really encouraging speeding uh, by having broad sweeping cur turns, by having wider lanes, by having wide shoulders. Um, uh, many of those, uh, the results of, of those practices is that vehicles really do have a perceived safe speed that is quite high. Uh, and so we're trying to make clear that uh, during the course of this that we want to make a clear delineation between when the freeway environment ends and when the local street environment ends. And we want that delineation to be abundantly clear to the road users uh, so that they adjust their behavior appropriately. So you have in front of you a, a photo of a pretty traditional interchange intersection uh, uh, from the perspective of looking at the off-ramp, uh, from the off-ramp, uh, and you can see that it looks like a pretty high-speed environment. What we're trying to achieve is something more akin uh, to Octavia Boulevard in, down in San Francisco, which is a, an interchange to US 101. So on the right, on the bottom right of the screen is actually the on and off-ramps to US 101. Uh, and then Octavia Boulevard, which is at the top left of the screen, uh, is the continuation of US 101 onto the local arterial system. Uh, you may recall that Octavia Boulevard uh, um, is actually a replacement of what was called the Central Freeway in San Francisco, which fell down during the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. So it did present the city with an opportunity to really remake uh, this area of the city, uh, and that was certainly part of it. But some unique features of Octavia Boulevard are that it has more trees than just about any street segment I've ever seen. Uh, it has a great set of frontage roads, uh, and you can see just from this design that it really does set the message that on you can't even see the freeway environment off to the bottom right, but you've just exited the freeway environment, and now here is what a local street feels like. Please adjust your behavior accordingly if, as, as a roadway user. We also had a series of guiding principles uh, throughout this process, the, the first of which is that you, we will provide bicycle and pedestrian facilities, so the idea of just this is not a place for PEDS, let's just not do it, is not on the table here. Um, the second is that we'll de design ramp geometries to encourage slower vehicle speeds uh, in general. Uh, but another really sort of um, finite message within that is, is slower vehicle speeds until you are past the crosswalk. So you'll see a number of the treatments that we uh, use, especially where we're adding multiple lanes to an on-ramp and so forth. We try to make those additional lanes occur 
after the crosswalk. We try to make the point of acceleration where vehicles occur after the crosswalk. Uh, so that's a key feature. Uh, we're located in the crosswalk at a location with the best visibility uh, and before the point where vehicles begin to accelerate. Uh, Mariana will go into more detail about how specifically we've done that when she gets into to that piece of, of the presentation. Um, uh, and we've also, where possible, made crosswalks as short as possible. There's sort of a balancing act between locating them at the best location for visibility and before the point of acceleration and crosswalks as short as possible. But especially where the crosswalks are signalized, we've made them as short as possible, and we've tried to make them as short as possible even at, at the other locations. Uh, another key thing and a, and a real uh, tough talking point during the course of our workshops, um, uh, and I should say that we had probably 30 to 50 people at each of the workshops that we hosted. Uh, and so it really was just a collaboration of, well, what, what is the consensus view of the people who are here today? It wasn't a standing panel of 30 to 50. It was whoever showed up. Uh, but they are all practicing transportation professionals. Uh, and the consensus view was that it's highly uncomfortable for cyclists to travel between two moving lanes for anything more than 200 linear feet. Um, uh, and so you'll see design treatments that we present within this guide that essentially uh, identify uh, treatments where there are ex exceptionally long right turn pockets, which are pretty common at interchange locations. You'll see unique treatments on how um, to transition bicyclists across from the curbside to the area between the right turn pocket and the through lane, uh, and uh, sort of where to do that, and where to do that in such a way that cyclists are never stuck between a right turn lane and a through lane for more than 200 linear feet. Uh, and one key component of that is that we also have a recommendation that Mariana will point out later about installation of buffer zones uh, as you get closer to the gore point of the interchange, uh, or the, the on-ramps especially. Um, so we'll talk about that later. Uh, we also then wanted to, uh, the other, other key consideration was sort of where to transition cyclists. Um, uh, and so one of the key considerations uh, was in an on-ramp configuration where you are going to move cyclists from the curb uh, to the area between the right turn pocket and the, and the through lane. Uh, do you prescribe a specific location where you'd like, where you'd like cyclists to merge over or do you, do you prescribe a zone? We, we went the, with the zonal approach, essentially saying that here is the zone in which cyclists should be looking for an appropriate gap in traffic and then transitioning to the left. Mariana will show that later also as we get into um, the individual case uh, of the on-ramps and off-ramps. Uh, finally, um, crosswalks treatments are such an enormous consideration. What is the appropriate traffic control, um, other physical attributes of crosswalks, uh, that rather than try to address those within the context of each intersection or interchange case, we actually have a separate section of the guide, and Megan will be talking about that here today, dealing with uh, uncontrolled crosswalks or unsignalized crosswalks. Um, uh, and so we're recommending use of uh, Fair and Pierce's developed tool, which we're happy to share with people. But it's, that tool is completely consistent with NTHRB 562, uh, the National Cooperative Highway Research Program 562, uh, and other research that Megan will talk about in a moment. Uh, uh, and also, I think TTI has developed a, a tool of this nature. But the idea is that rather than prescribing crosswalk treatments at each location, we're prescribing a tool. Use this tool, determine what is the appropriate traffic control uh, for each crosswalk, and be consistent about that because you're using uh, the national best practice that's um, included in this tool. Uh, another guiding principle was really uh, trying, to uh, trying to reduce speeds, as I said earlier. Uh, and, and one of the issues that we talked about was what is the appropriate angle at which uh, vehicles should approach the arterial system. Uh, so this is maybe an extreme case, but uh, the traditionally uh, the, the thinking was that vehicles should approach at an angle that's almost pa as parallel as you can get to the, uh, to the um, arterial system so that they can be traveling at a comparable speed and make easy merges and so forth. Uh, and we're really getting away from that for a couple of reasons. One, that, that those types of merges are, we now know are, are not as safe as, as a more official uh, either stop or yield control, uh, or, or I'm sorry, stop or signal control, stop sign or signal control. Uh, the other reason is we have an aging population. Uh, and so the amount of um, turning of the head required for the maneuver that's identified for the vehicle on this off-ramp is over 110 degrees. 
uh, which for many aging population people is just too far. So I, I'm sure everybody knows that when you make this type of emerge, you're not only supposed to check your rearview mirror and your side mirror, but you're also supposed to look over your shoulder. And if you as an older person or a person with disability cannot do so, uh, then it makes this design inherently unsafe. Uh, so we've been moving toward the design that's um, where possible not more than 70 degrees uh, offset uh, uh, from the arterial street. The idea being that this is a speed that, uh, or an angle that uh, encourages slower speed uh, and also uh, has uh, good visibility for uh, the driver who's exiting the ramp. Uh, it also has other benefits. I'm sure you all have seen the, the slides that talk about the amount of distance a crosswalk is given the, the given, given different angles uh, as well as the um, amount of pedestrian exposure. So it has all of those types of benefits as well. So the 70 degrees is a maximum in this case. We don't want you to exceed, exceed 70 degrees. Uh, as a, an example of that, uh, here's a positive example um, of a ramp that um, used to have a broad sweeping cor cor uh, curve. You can see the red line indicates the old alignment of this off-ramp. Uh, and you can see the new curb line as well, uh, which the old alignment obviously encouraged a higher speeds. Uh, it also had a significantly higher crosswalk distance. Uh, so identified in the red, if we can get the slide. I'm sorry, in the green, and the red is the old cross, crossing distance, which is quite long. Uh, and then the green is the new crossing distance. So there's a lot of benefits to this. It also does clearly send the, look like and feel like a different interchange configuration, sends a message, you're now on the local arterial street, all of which were um, our, um, our objectives. This is an example from Springfield, Oregon. Then I, my last slide is about design assumptions. Um, we needed to make a series of assumptions. Essentially what we were, wanted to do with this was to prepare a, a series of design examples of interchanges uh, that Mariana will go through. And so in doing so, we needed to make a host of design assumptions. Uh, some of these assumptions are fairly conservative, uh, and that is in the context of uh, this, these being state DOT operated facilities. So uh, you certainly have the latitude to adjust these, but at least for the examples you're going to see today, uh, which are all AutoCAD generated graphics, um, uh, the assumptions that we've assumed are that bike lanes are six feet in, in width that sidewalks are six, six feet in width. We have asked, tried to include landscape buffers between the uh, arterial street and the adjacent sidewalk uh, wherever possible, and those landscape buffers are at least five feet uh, in width. Uh, we've used 12-foot lanes as, a, as our standard lane width uh, throughout this example. It's pretty consistent with uh, what our state DOT Caltrans uses on most interchange locations um, and our experience in working in other states as well. But there is lots of new research out that really indicates that there are opportunities, especially in locations that don't have heavy trucks uh, and bus maneuverings, don't, don't have large vehicles, uh, and have moderate speeds uh, for using 10 and 11 foot lanes. So that's at your latitude to make those changes. Where we have assumed there are shoulders, we've assumed an 8 foot right shoulder and a left foot uh, left shoulder. Uh, I'm sorry, a 4 foot left shoulder. Um, uh, we have assumed uh, in doing our turn radii and other things a, an Ashto WB50 design vehicle, which is a 55-foot truck with trailer. Uh, uh, even during the course of doing this project, the design standards have, have the, the, the tool, the list of tools that's available to us as practitioners has changed. So when we started this, uh, green bike lanes were not approved for use federally. Uh, the Hawk beacons were not approved for use uh, in California. Rapid rectangular fashion beacons were not approved for use. All of those have changed just during the two and a half years that we've been working on this project. Um, so you'll see that we do discuss green bike lanes, but just by virtue of when we started this project, they are not illustrated uh, in many of these examples. Uh, we're also not showing buffered bike lanes, uh, but those are also options that can easily be incorporated into many of the designs uh, that you'll see here today. Um, and, I, and so I guess the bottom line on many of these uh, design assumptions is that you really should treat, the, treat these as context sensitive to the extent that you have a context that is really a slow street environment, then you might want to be looking at uh, sh um, either not having shoulders or having narrower shoulders, reducing lane widths, uh, potentially uh, adding additional uh, separation between uh, vehicles and cyclists using colored bike lanes and so forth. Um, 
uh, and, and, and overall achieving the best possible sight distance that, that you can throughout. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Marianne, I'm sorry, to Megan, who's going to talk about crosswalks, and then Marianne will talk about the interchange examples. Thanks very, very much, Matthew. Uh, so as, as Matthew mentioned, the reason that we talk about crosswalks kind of more globally before we get into the specific examples uh, is because in our specific case studies, we've basically just identified where crosswalks should be marked in terms of the location. Um, but it's really a context-sensitive issue in terms of how those crosswalks need to be enhanced beyond just signing and striping. And, and that really has to do with kind of the research behind uncontrolled crosswalks and what types of safety enhancements are helpful um, based on the context. Uh, that research um, has more than 30 years of history, uh, with the most kind of current and important of that being the Federal Highway Administration study that Charlie Zagier led um, in 2000-2002 uh, that looked at a thousand matched pairs of marked versus unmarked um, uncontrolled crosswalks across the country. Uh, and this looked at the question of um, whether or not installing a marked crosswalk at an uncontrolled location uh, lead, it could lead to be associated with more um, pedestrian vehicle collisions. There has been previous research, uh, notably a study by uh, Bruce Herms back in the 1970s in San Diego that had found a higher incident of collisions uh, at marked crosswalk locations. And so what this research that the um, Federal Highway Administration Commission um, did was to try to get a, a little bit more fine-grained nuance of that study to uh, determine whether it's globally just simply the marking of crosswalk or there's something more at play. Um, and what this matrix does is, is um, um, digs, uh, digs into more detail on that and shows that it really does have to do with the context. So that the number of, of uh, cars on the road, the vehicle um, average daily traffic, the speed of those vehicles, and then also the number of lanes. Um, and it's at the, the top left of this matrix, the slow speed, um, you know, uh, narrow roadways and low volume of traffic, that there was not a statistically significant difference um, in marking a crosswalk uh, than not marking the crosswalk. Uh, but in the, the bottom right-hand corner of this matrix where we see the higher number of vehicles, higher speeds, and, and wider roadways, um, it, there was a finding that marking a crosswalk alone uh, was associated with more pedestrian vehicle collisions. Uh, the most important takeaway from the study was not, therefore, you should not mark crosswalks and you should not give pedestrians accommodations in those locations, uh, but that you will need to do more than just paint the two white lines in order to um, create a safe and accessible location for pedestrians. Um, and one other kind of key finding of this study was around the medians and the importance of medians that you could um, actually go up to about 15,000 vehicles per day uh, before you really get into that needing to do more range, uh, whereas without a meeting, median it's a 12,000 vehicles per day as a threshold. This study has really been um, formally adopted now as part of the 2009 federal MTCD as the guidance for at uncontrolled locations uh, when, to, when to mark and when to enhance marking. A follow-on study to that Federal Highway Study, uh, Federal Highway Administration study, is the NCHRP 562 report uh, led by TTI uh, that said, okay, well, if we know that we're in certain scenarios where we need to do more than just mark, uh, what are the tools in our toolbox, and which ones are more effective in which context? And I always stress the findings of this and some more recent studies that have looked at even even more um, recently available tools. Um, to, to let people know this is not a bright, shiny object situation. It's not just like, oh, this is the next greatest and latest tool that's applied this at our, at our location that we're studying or that the community is asking for. Most of these tools were really designed strategically for a certain collision type or a certain context that needed a safety enhancement. And so this study and others that have, have followed have, that have done a great job of really matching uh, this is the type of treatment that's available for this particular context, and this is the effectiveness. Um, typically, most of the studies have been effectiveness in terms of increasing driver yielding behavior, but there's uh, even the ones, the ones that have taken it a step farther that look at what is the collision reduction factor associated with these tools. We have created a tool that essentially automates there's, um, a series of different worksheet appendices in Report 562. Uh, so we have created a tool that automates the, the treatment identification process that you put in um, inputs around the context of the location that you are going to be installing a marked crosswalk. And the output of this tool is um, what are the, the best matches in terms of the, the research effectiveness 
of the, the tool um, for the condition that you're looking at. Go to the next slide. The first thing that the tool matches for is whether or not you need a pedestrian signal warrant. If you do, that'll be the, the recommended treatment. Uh, the next thing that it tests for is the pedestrian hybrid beacon. Um, here it's still showing uh, the Hawk signal, which is the, the terminology at the time we created this tool that was commonly used. Um, if it doesn't meet the threshold for one of those two warrants, uh, then it's going to look at the kind of the, um, the effectiveness studies based on the context that you're in uh, to give you the different types of beacons or warning devices, or in some cases just signing in striping uh, based on kind of the, the conditions that you're looking at. Um, something that we've added to this tool that wasn't part of 562 um, is we also always check to see whether or not this is a good location for median based on whether there's room available and there's not currently one, and also whether it's a so candidate for a road diet or a lane reduction uh, just based on the number of lanes that you're inputting and the, the volume that you're saying is available there or is just currently present there. Uh, one other thing to point out about the tool and kind of the engine behind the tool is that it's, um, in this follows the 562 methodology. Uh, it's based on the combination of the pedestrian level of service um, using the delay method. Um, so the delay to the pedestrian across the street and then also the expected motorist compliance, meaning the tendency of a motorist um, to yield to a pedestrian at this location. Uh, so the higher the tendency to yield and the less delayed the pedestrian is or the better the level of service, the less intense of a treatment the tool recommends. So it might be high visibility crosswalks uh, with some advanced signage. Um, on the flip side, the, the more intense of a scenario that you're in, so the greater the delay and the lower the chance that a driver would likely yield to a pedestrian in the location, um, that's where you're getting into kind of more of the red indication level, um, such as, as the uh, pedestrian hybrid beacon um, or the, the pedestrian signal if it is so um, one, just, sorry, one, one other thing to, to point out about this is that the recommendations are cumulative, meaning as you get to the more intense levels, um, it will recommend that the level that you've reached plus the additional levels below it. So um, even though you might get a place that you're doing some type of a warning beacon, it's still going to recommend doing the high visibility um, striping and signage um, and also looking at potential geometric enhancements such as uh, curb extensions or beacon. I wanted to point out a couple of the particular tools that are likely going to be useful in the interchange context. Uh, because these are really a, a highly effective tools for the more complicated scenarios that we are likely to run into. Um, for the most part, what I'm talking about, crosswalk enhancements, these are going to be um, across the on or off ramps that are going to be uncontrolled. Uh, we are going to talk about the, the buoy context later on in Mariana's presentation, um, and that's another context where it's actually the crossing of the arterial that would be what we'd be considering. Um, so the rectangular rapid flashing beacon is a device that has provisional approval uh, for use in, in the U.S. It's going through the experimentation process right now. Um, it is, uh, has uh, received very highly effective ratings in recent research studies and is, is uh, really having widespread implementation right now. And it can be installed either in a, a two-sign or four-sign installation. Uh, so if there's not a median, it's just one side on, sign on either side of the street. If there's a median, it's a sign on either side of the street, plus the sign in the median with a front and back option. And it has a, a, an alternating beacon that's installed right below the, the diagonal or the, the diamond-shaped sign um, that has a very rapid alternation pattern that's, that's very visible. It has uh, been associated with a very high yielding rate. Another device I mentioned earlier, just kind of how many of these tools have been developed to address a particular um, crash type or a particular safety concern, and this is for sure um, one of those that is a very low-cost, uh, high-benefit tool available for multi-lane roads in particular. Um, what this tool is designed for was to encourage the yielding behavior to happen 20 to 50 feet in advance of a crosswalk so that when a driver in one lane yields, the pedestrian is able to still see what's happening in that next lane. This is why on multi-lane roads it's really important. And vice versa, the driver is able to see what's happening in the crosswalk. Um, if the yielding happens right adjacent to the crosswalk, a multiple threat scenario happens uh, where that side triangle is blocked. So putting these ideally about 20 feet in advance on a multi-lane uh, can really open up the visibility of the location. And finally, the pedestrian hybrid beacon is another device that may be um, a uh, particularly useful in the interchange on and off ramps and potentially the crossing of, of the arterial. Uh, there is a warrant for installation of these. 
and it's called a hybrid beacon because they it functions kind of halfway between a traffic signal and a stop sign. And a good way to think about the kind of mechanism, of the mechanics of that is on the next slide. Uh, these are the different uh, phases of, of the pedestrian hybrid beacon. Uh, it rests in blank, so it's just a, a dark signal when there's not a pedestrian present um, and, and vehicles just um, continue on and, and do not have to, to stop at this location. Uh, when the pedestrian arrives and either presses a, a push button or it otherwise uh, actuates the signal, um, the, the um, hybrid beacon first goes into flashing yellow and then a steady yellow and then goes to steady red, at which point the pedestrian gets the walk indication. At the start of the clearance interval, um, the pedestrian gets the flashing don't walk, ideally accommodated, of course, by the, the, the pedestrian countdown signal. Uh, and then the wig bag movement happens for the hybrid beacon. Um, this is, um, indicates to the driver that they need to stop, but then they can proceed if the crosswalk is clear. And this is the a portion of the hybrid beacon that makes it uh, more similar to a stop sign than a traffic signal and also creates um, a nice balance between a red indication for safety benefits for the pedestrian crossing, um, but a more efficient and uh, less um, delay impact on the roadway because the driver is able to proceed um, during the phase rather than needing to uh, stay stopped for the full um, length of the signal phase. And then at the conclusion of the pedestrian clearance interval, returns to a steady hand and a blank signal for the driver. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mariana, and she's going to walk us through several different case study examples of how these different guiding principles and um, design assumptions that Matthew and I have presented um, can be put into play for some specific scenarios. Thank you, Megan. So as, uh, as Megan just said, uh, the walking through the cases is a way of highlighting some of the design principles that Matthew described, as well as some of the crosswalk treatments that we just went through. Um, as we go uh, through each list, uh, the cases will go from the simplest to, to the most complex, which also correspond to the lowest stress level to, and to the highest stress levels for uh, pedestrians and, and bicyclists. And you'll notice that a lot, of the, a lot of the guiding principles and treatments will repeat from case to case, and I'm going to try to highlight them only once. And so I'm going to talk about a lot of them at the very beginning, and then as we go through the cases, you're going to see them repeat, but I'm only going to discuss things that are new in each case. And so the first, uh, the first on-ramp case is the on-ramp entered from a shared through right lane, which you see down here at the bottom of this image. And so this case is not really different than a right turn uh, from one street onto another. Um, and I'm going to blow this up a little bit so that we can look at the specific elements a little bit better. So to illustrate the design principles, um, we have provided here a series of examples. Uh, the first one is that the ramp geometry is designed to encourage vehicles to slow down before they enter the on-ramp over here, as Matthew described earlier. The second one is that uh, we recommend that the bike lane be dashed uh, before before uh, the approach to the, at the approach to the on-ramp, and the purpose of uh, dashing the bike lane is to highlight the conflict point uh, between the bicycles and the vehicles that are trying to access the on-ramp. Um, and so in this case, uh, the bicycles are going straight, and so it's the vehicles who have to merge, uh, which is, is still a relatively low-stress situation for the bikes, uh, but we do feel the need uh, to highlight this, this location to make it clear to everyone that something different is happening here. And this is a good example of where uh, a, one of the more recently approved treatments could be used, such as a collared bike lane or a collared skip, skip striping, would be a, a good way to further highlight the conflict point between the bicycles and the vehicles. We also uh, recommend that uh, an exit ramp be provided for bicycles because we recognize that not every cyclist is going to be comfortable moving through uh, a, a location where there, there's a conflict zone such as this. And so this is something that you're going to see repeat from case to case uh, because we, we feel that it's necessary to always, always give an option uh, for bicyclists to actually get off the arterial um, and follow the pedestrian path to the crosswalk if they are not comfortable um, staying on the roadway as they go through the interchange. 
the fourth uh, design principle that we illustrate here is a directional curb ramp with trun uh, truncated domes um, and high visibility striping uh, for all the crosswalks. This is something that you're going to see at every single crossing. Um, and together with this design principle goes the idea that the crosswalk should be located where the speeds are lowest and the visibility is highest. You're also going to notice here that we do not we did not strike the crosswalk at the point where it would provide the shortest crossing um, at, at the on-ramp. And the reason for that is because we originally did have, uh, we did have the crosswalk striped that way. And one of the comments that we received uh, from a number of people in the, in the workshops and in the review panel was that pedestrians will actually never walk that way because it would take them uh, too far out of their desire line. Um, and they would be tempted to actually walk outside of the crosswalk. And so we decided that we that the best approach would be to split the, split the difference between providing the shortest crossing and providing the most direct crossing. And so this is why at the cases where we don't have a square intersection, you see that the crosswalks are always going to be a little skewed. Uh, this, uh, the HOV lane added downstream of the crosswalk uh, is something that Matthew mentioned, <clears throat> and we do this uh, for two reasons. One, because uh, we can provide the shortest crossing for the pedestrians if they are crossing only a single lane. And two, because we reduce the risk of multiple threat, which Megan explained just a little while ago, uh, by removing uh, the two lanes from the crossing. And so. Uh, by providing the HOV lane downstream from the crosswalk, we improve the safety of the pedestrians right of the crosswalk. And there's actually a third reason, um, and that is that we expect people to be speeding up as they go into that HOV lane. And so we make sure that that, uh, that change in speed doesn't happen until they're past the crosswalk. I think this is the last guiding principle in this slide. Uh, this is the landscape buffer provided between the pedestrian path of travel and the bike lane and the vehicle, uh, the vehicle lanes. And this is designed uh, to improve the level of comfort of the pedestrians along the arterial. The second case that we're going to talk about is an on-ramp entered from, sh from a short single right lane. And the difference between this and the previous case is that in this case, the, uh, the vehicles have a dedicated lane to access the on-ramp. And so as you can see here, in this case, the vehicles actually have to cross the bike lane completely in order to get to the on-ramp. And so the stress level for the bicyclist is a, a step up from the previous case. Uh, but the bicycles are still going straight. Uh, so it's not, it's not a terrible situation, but definitely uh, a little bit more uh, a little bit more stress in this case. The elements that you see in this whole image are all the same as we talked about in the previous case. The third case is the on-ramp entered from a long single right lane. Now this is uh, a bit different than the previous two cases in that now both the vehicles and the bikes have to merge across each other. And so in this case, not only do we provide the skip striping uh, at the end of the bike lane on one side and the beginning at the, on the other side, but we actually break the skip striping to indicate that there's something a little bit different yet that's happening at this location. And so that's just another way of highlighting the weaving zone between the vehicles and the bicycles. And I wanted to highlight in this slide that we we have definitely moved off of A to 80 territory here. This is definitely a case where we don't expect that all age groups and all uh, bicycle abilities would, would be able to uh, negotiate uh, the transition at this location. And so features such as the, the bicycle exit ramp, which we have already talked about, become more important in a situation such as this. And there's a bike weaving zone. The fourth case is the on-ramp entered from a long dual right lane. And so I don't think I have to explain that this is a far higher level of stress uh, for bicycles because now we're talking about not only uh, a longer transition for the vehicles, which allows them to be moving at faster speeds, but we're also talking about the bicycles having to negotiate vehicles across two lanes. 
in order to get to the other side um, of the bike lane here. And so uh, in this case, in addition to all of the other treatments that we have already talked about, we also provide a median separating uh, the bike lane from uh, the two on-ramp turn lanes, uh, recognizing that it's really uncomfortable for bicycles to be traveling in a bike lane between two lanes of moving vehicles for a very long stretch, as Matthew mentioned earlier. Uh, the other thing that is different about this case is that now we have pedestrians at an uncontrolled crossing across two lanes of traffic. And so in this case, we also recommend that the advanced yield line be provided uh, to encourage vehicles to stop well short of the crosswalk to minimize the risk of multiple threat. And so in this case, if we can encourage vehicles to stop away from the crosswalk, then we preserve the visibility between pedestrians and vehicles in the case where there is one vehicle stopped and another vehicle approaching. And there's the median. Let's move on and talk about the off-ramps. The first case, the first off-ramp case is an arterial entered from a stop merge off-ramp. And we actually show two versions of this. Um, in this particular case, we have uh, we actually have a stop controlled off-ramp, which is about the best case scenario for both bicycles and, uh, and pedestrians. And so we do provide uh, the skip striping across the off-ramp, but this is really no different than a typical intersection uh, that is stop controlled. And so really not a lot of discomfort for either peds or bikes in this situation. And then the second version of the same would be a situation where we have uh, an arterial entry from uh, a dual uh, ramp, a stop merge off-ramp off that provides access to both sides of the arterial. And so again, it's top controlled, and so it's a pretty comfortable situation. But we do recommend that, uh, that advanced uh, stop bar be added to encourage vehicles to yield uh, at the crosswalk. The second off-ramp off case is the arterial entered from a free off-ramp. Now here we start getting to a different level of stress again, because now we're no longer talking about a controlled off-ramp. And in addition to that, the vehicles exiting the freeway have their own dedicated uh, lane along the arterial. And so they can uh, continue on at a relatively high speed uh, onto the arterial. And so we provide all of the elements that we have talked about before. But in addition to that, I'm going to move to the next slide to highlight this point. We have introduced uh, pavement marking asking the bicycles to yield. One of the questions that we have received in the last round of comments uh, on the guide was why should the bicycles be the ones who are asked to yield since they are they're moving along the arterial, which is the primary movement at this at this condition. And there are actually two reasons for that. One is because we recognize that, that there may be a, a speed differential between the bicycles on the arterial and the vehicles exiting uh, the freeway at the off-ramp. And so we understand that the vehicles are going to be moving faster. And uh, we can't guarantee that they are going to yield to the bikes. And second, it's, there's a danger that the, the exiting vehicles are actually not going to see the bicycles approaching, um, especially since they have their own dedicated uh, lane along the arterial. They may not expect any kind of traffic to be in conflict with them. And so for those two reasons, we felt that it would be uh, prudent to introduce an element that would increase the safety for uh, the bicycles at, lo at a location such as this. The third off-ramp case is the arterial entered from a two-lane um, off-ramp where one of the off-ramp lanes is shared with an arterial lane. And in this case, we don't feel that we can provide uh, sufficient elements to protect bicycles and pedestrians without a signal. And so this would be uh, a signalized condition. Uh, and we would recommend that bicycle detection be provided to ensure that the bicycles along the arterial always get their turn at, at the off-ramp. Fourth off-ramp case is the arterial entered from uh, two-lane off-ramp and two free uh, right turns. This is, again, uh, a, definitely a higher level of stress uh, for 
the bicycles and the pedestrians. And so uh, again, you see the yield at the bike lane, but this is a good opportunity to investigate the possibility of additional crosswalk treatments such as the ones that Megan has described. In particular, if we were to place a pedestrian hybrid beacon at this location, it could benefit the bicycles as well as the pedestrians so long as we could provide uh, actuation control for the bicycles uh, at the edge of the sidewalk. And so definitely a uh, kind of condition where we would recommend investigating further treatments uh, for the crossing of both bikes and beds. Oh, and here again, you see the advanced yield limit line, like we have seen before, to encourage vehicles to stop uh, well short of the crosswalk and minimize the risk of uh, multiple threats. This slide is an example of how an interchange could be retrofitted to reflect a lot of these uh, guiding principles that we have just discussed. And so the, the cross red hatch is where we might remove sections of, of the on and off ramps. Uh, the brown solid line is where we might choose to locate the new on and off ramps. And you can see that they're all much more square to the arterial, which is the recommended design practice to slow down uh, the speeds along uh, the, the on and off ramps. And then you can see that uh, there's a, a real added benefit to uh, retrofitting an interchange in this way, and that is that you gain a lot of land along the edges of the arterial just by realigning the on and off ramps over here. And so this is just prime real estate since it, it's adjacent to the freeway, but it also minimizes the dead zone for pedestrians, which is the, the area along the arterial where there is no activity along the edge of the road. So instead of going from all the way over here to all the way over here with really zero interest for pedestrians, you have really shortened that distance to perhaps about half of what it was before. And so there, there are a lot of things that can be done with existing interchanges to uh, improve both the safety of pedestrians and bikes and improve the overall land use of the area. I wanted to highlight before we move on that there are certain designs that we actually don't even see in the presentation and we don't include in the guide. And the reason for that is that we don't think that these designs can be retrofitted very easily. And so this is an example of that. This is a condition where the on-ramp has uh, one through lane and then one lane shared with the arterial. And so we think that it's just too difficult to accommodate pedestrians and bicycles adequately here because it's too there's too much uncertainty in whether a car in this outer lane over here is actually going through or turning uh, into the off ramp and so we just don't don't feel that this can be retrofitted really easily uh, to accommodate peds and bikes adequately without actually changing the operation of a situation such as this so what we would recommend is that the second lane onto the on ramp be either made an on-ramp lane or be kept as just a, a through lane on the arterial so that we would remove the, uncert the uncertainty that happens right here in this case. And then before we move on to uh, the third set of case, case studies, I wanted to also mention some of the designs that are not discussed. Obviously, there are a lot of different kinds of designs uh, for interchanges inter out there. And there are designs that are becoming more and more popular. Uh, and they're often really, really complicated, as you can see in the double crossover diamond image here. And so we did not, we didn't cover the whole uh, scope of possible interchanges in the guide. Instead, what we did was we picked one uh, kind of interchange that is becoming more and more popular. Uh, and that is the single point urban interchange, or SPUI. Uh, and this, this design is becoming popular because it's efficient. Uh, it's efficient for vehicles because it, uh, they can be controlled with a single traffic signal right here in the middle. Unfortunately, what happens in a situation like uh, a SPUI is that the efficiency of moving vehicles comes at the cost of uh, 
safety and uh, accommodations for pedestrians and bicycles. This is uh, difficult to uh, make uh, accessible to bikes and peds, and we're going to see in the next slides just exactly how. This is an example of an actual spooey. It's in Pleasant Hill, California, not far from us here in San Francisco. Um, and the spooey is actually under uh, the overpass in this case. But you can, you can get an idea of just how complicated uh, this all is underneath the, the overpass here and how many lanes are coming from, from how many directions. And so uh, how difficult it might be to actually accommodate bike and beds in this, this condition. Just to illustrate it a little bit more, here's a representation of a spui in plan. And we're going to talk about where uh, we might like to put a pedestrian crossing, for example, which would be right there. But typically, in the spui, you have three movements and in, in in three phases of the traffic signal. And so the first phase is the through movement along the arterial. The second phase is the off-ramps onto the arterial from, uh, from the freeway. And then the third phase would be the movement from the arterial onto the on-ramps. And so as you can see in this animation, there is no point where you can provide a pedestrian phase together with a vehicle phase without providing something like an all-red for the vehicle, because there is a conflict between the pedestrian crossing in every single phase of the signal as it is um, at a spui. And so the way that we uh, make up for that, or the way that we get around this, this issue, one way, one solution, would be to provide a two-step crossing for pedestrians. And so here is the two-stage crossing solution to the pedestrian crossing at a spui. So now, instead of having the pedestrians cross the entire arterial in one go, you would provide um, a crossing uh, to the median and then a second crossing to the other side. And we're going to see in the animation how this is then accommodated. Oh, I'm sorry. And we the, the pedestrian crossing signal would be coordinated with all the downstream signals along the arterial. But now, if we can provide the dual stage crossing, uh, then the pedestrians now can move with the on and off ramp phases of the signal. And so the first pedestrian crossing can happen with the, together with the off ramp movement from the, from the freeway. And then the second stage of the crossing can happen with the on ramp movements. And so this is one way to accommodate the pedestrians at the spui. I also wanted to highlight that we strongly recommend uh, skip striping at, uh, at a spui. And that's because if you can imagine the situation if the skip striping weren't there, there's a tremendous amount of uh, uncertainty. There's just a whole lot of asphalt here. And if they were completely unmarked, it would be very unclear for all modes, really, not just pedestrians and bicycles, uh, but also vehicles as to where they need to go, depending on where they're headed. And so we really would recommend that skip striping be included at a spui to make, uh, to make all of the movements more clear. The second way to accommodate the pedestrians and bicycles at the spui would be to actually remove the crossing from the spui, from the, the spui area altogether. And so we would provide uh, pedestrian crossing uh, downstream and upstream of the spui. And, and then the, the crossings can be checked for a traffic signal warrant. Or uh, this would also be a, a really excellent candidate for other crosswalk treatments, as Megan has described. So either a rectangular rapid flashing beacon or a pedestrian hybrid beacon uh, would be potentially appropriate for a pedestrian crossing such as this. There's one last thing I wanted to point out uh, related to accommodating the bicycles at, at the SPUI, and that is that one of the comments that we have received recently has to do with the bicycle clearance interval across the SPUI. Um, here in California, uh, the MUTCD has a limit on the yellow phase and the all red phase, and they're each six seconds. And so the question came up, if you were to provide six plus six, would that be sufficient time 
for a bicycle to negotiate the crossing. And that's something that we're investigating right now. We are trying to actually look at some real traffic uh, signal phasing and to establish whether that's really a problem. And then we will come up with you know, appropriate recommendations to address it uh, if it seems like it really would be difficult for a bicycle to complete the crossing uh, given the traffic, the traffic signal phasing. And I think with that, I'm going to send it back to Matthew for some uh, closing remarks. Thank you, Mariana. So um, that's mostly the conclusion of our of our presentation, but I did want to just make the final note that uh, uh, we really view this as an evolutionary process that, that um, uh, as Mariana went through the presentation, especially as she went through the different cases and got to the cases that had multiple on-ramp lanes and so forth, it became clear that the accommodations for bicyclists and for pedestrians um, were not maybe ideal. Um, but they are far in uh, an advancement over, I think, many of the common practices today. And so we do view this as, uh, and the AASHTO uh, guides uh, and the MHTC as being evolutionary documents. Um, we're hopeful that, that um, uh, more treatments will be available in the future. But one of the considerations we talked about early on was needing to adhere to, to national guidance, uh, either AASHTO or, or MHTCD and so forth. Um, and so. Uh, the accommodations for bikes and pets are not always going to be as ideal as we'd like. They're a vast improvement over what uh, we see in many cases at current on and off ramps. And we hope that over the course of the next 10 and 20 years, we'll get even better. Uh, and uh, with that, I, I will uh, conclude our, our presentation and uh, look forward to answering questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Matthew, Megan, and Mariana. Uh, at this point, we will start taking questions. If you've not already done so, please enter your questions in the box on the screen. Uh, also, as a reminder, the webinar slides and a recording will be posted uh, online. Uh, the slides will be available later today, and uh, the recording uh, in a week, couple weeks. Uh, just check with us on Facebook just to find out when that is. Uh, so the first question. Our posted speed limits are too high. What resources do you suggest to justify lowering speed? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Um, there is a lot of discussion right now about uh, changing the mechanism or the, the um, procedures through which speeds are set, but I won't get into all the details of that. I know if you're not aware, ITE uh, has been working on a, a, another information report uh, about setting speed limits, and actually it's even within the context of ITE, it's been highly controversial. Uh, with many different and varying opinions. Um, but I will say that uh, sort of the standard line on this, on this is that uh, many of the treatments that we're talking about trying to implement here with our, have the intention of reducing the perceived safe speed of, of the facilities. Um, so the general practice would be to implement those design practices, uh, measure whether you have, in fact, changed the perceived safe, safe speed, and then to go out and change the speed limit retroactively to accommodate what is now a, a new uh, 85th percentile speed for, for those roadways. Um, uh, so that is the way that it's currently uh, the, the best practice. That's probably an example of, of something that might evolve over time uh, in that you may be able to have other metrics and considerations in the, in the setting of speed limits. OK. When will the draft be published on the ITE website? Question. Megan, do you know the answer to that? <laughs> well, we're on the hook for, for the, the bottleneck of it right now, I believe. Yes, uh, so we, we have received the latest round of panel feedback, and, and now we need to go through it. The rather exhaustive and productive list uh, that we need to both update the document on and then um, uh, document our responses to each of them. I think right. that we've talked about kind of a mid to late July as being our target for getting that back to ITE, uh, and then I believe kind of Shortly thereafter, that will go up onto the website. So I would say late summer would be the target. And then, as Becky mentioned, there will be a, the public review round, um, which hopefully maybe will put us within like the, the close of the year for having it finalized, assuming that review round goes pretty smoothly. Um, the results of the panel voting were approved. Um, there were definitely some really constructive um, points that we need to address, uh, but it did, it did pass the, the balloting. All right. Um, was speed a consideration for the 200-foot 
uh, recommended maximum distance when a bike lane is between a right turn lane and a through lane? And would the bike lane width also be a factor in uh, bicyclist comfort there? I don't remember explicitly describing talking about speed uh, in that context. And, and my own, and so, and I should I described the process through which we we derived that, which was essentially a group of people who. And so it's the combined wisdom of a bunch of people, um, which is quite different than something that is researched and so forth. So you know, take it for what it is. But the the combined wisdom of, of this group of people uh, and myself, uh, or my own experience in those environments, is that is it's uncomfortable to be between two moving lanes of traffic. Uh, in any context, definitely more so in a high-speed context, um, but in any context. Uh, I do agree, that, I, and I think the, the sort of intention of that comment, is, the second part of it is that, hey, if there's a wider bike lane or even some striped buffers, it might be slightly more comfortable, and I would, I would agree with that assessment. So if that's something that you can accommodate within your design, um, then by all means, you should do that. With the XWalk tool, how how uh, would uh, attendees access that tool? Is there a URL or a website? Megan, I'll let you answer that. And you're the primary author of that tool. Uh, people can contact me. My my email address is shown here on the closing screen, and we have a um, a version of it that is essentially kind of our um, our locked version. So it um, it doesn't enable you to customize it, uh, but it does enable you to to use the full features of it. Uh, and, and we frequently work with um, with jurisdictions to customize it if there are specific um, elements of the toolbox uh, that, that you would like to see or maybe not to include um, based on uh, the, the tools that you use in your jurisdiction. And I would just add that there is an accompanying user's guide. And one of the reasons that we don't just give out the software, um, make it accessible to the download it from our website directly, is that we really want people to get both the tool and the, and the guide concurrently and to use them in, in that fashion. Are yield lines or, or shark's teeth defined in most state laws, like stop lines? And do motorists understand the meaning of yield lines? So it actually varies based on what your state law is. If, if the state law is yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk or stop for pedestrians in the crosswalk. Uh, here in California, our law is yield, and so we use the shark's teeth or the advantage limit lines, which is the upside down triangles that we've shown in the photos. Um, in states such as Oregon and Washington and, and, and many others where the, the law is stop for pedestrians, then you would use your, your traditional um, solid uh, stop bar uh, that you would do it in advance so that it has the same benefit on the, the multiple threats. Uh, they are included as a device in the NETC. It's actually not a new device, um, but it, it's not um, it's very consistently used. I think that is uh, part of the reason why there are certainly concerns from my perspective uh, that people don't know what it means. There's a sign that accompanies it that says yield here, uh, which is supposed to help with that. But um, I have been uh, urging um, jurisdictions to do two things. One is to go ahead and make that part of the crosswalk policy, to make it part of their standard installation practices for all multi-lane uncontrolled crosswalks that they have at a minimum, high visibility crosswalk stripings and advanced field or stop bars. Uh, and, and also in doing so, that will increase the um, awareness of it, but to have some um, associated educational uh, messaging uh, to make sure that, that people know what they're for, because if, if you don't use them in the way they're designed for, then they're not as powerful. All right. A newly installed hybrid beacon in our area is unfamiliar to most drivers who tend to ignore it since they don't understand why it is flashing or solid yellow or red. Do you have any experience or suggestions on how to better educate drivers? Uh, well, that, I mean, go, ahead, go ahead, Megan. I was just going to note that, that um, there's been a, a lot of research on these. In fact, there needed to be a lot of research on them for them to be become an, a, an approved device. Um, you know, they, they were first used in, in Arizona and in, in Tucson, but have since you know, been used um, very widespread now across the United States. And, and I do think it's one of those, um, you know, the, the more you have them, the more of them there are, the, the more that um, their, the use of them is going to become. Um, understood, uh, but the research into them showed that there was a, a pretty quick learning curve that once they were installed, they were used well, and that that kind of perceived concern about nobody will know how to use these. Um, we, we have kind of a 
frequent examples of the blank signals um, either at fire stations or with rant meters that, that people understand when they're in blank. Uh, they, they can be dismissed, but when, when they're eliminated, they need to be paid attention to. Uh, so I, I, I do appreciate that when they're brand new, especially if they're the only one and that there's not been any kind of educational messaging that they could be confusing. But I do think that the research has shown that um, when, when used um, on more of a widespread basis, consistent basis, um, that there's not um, a kind of a comprehension um, major concern with them. I, I would like I to would add, add. Oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> no, go ahead. Oh, I would just add that, um, well, from my own experience in having, we've designed and, and overseen the installation of a couple of these and um, in, in areas where they are new. And, and my experience is that um, in some areas that, that uh, um, vehicles will not understand what the wigwag phase is, and also they'll continue to stop during the wigwag phase. I have not seen an installation of this where vehicles just outright ignore the signal because they don't understand it. Uh, so if anything, my experience has been that, that vehicles tend to overstop, if that's the word. Um, uh, uh, and so there, and I, but I uh, w would go back to Megan's comment about the advanced stop bar or yield bar and say that this is also an opportunity for some education in, um, in coordination with the installation of a new device. Um, and then the last perspective I would bring is that, that um, typically on newer installed devices, if a, if a user is relatively uncertain about what it is and uh, if it's a new situation, my experience is that people tend to be more cautious in that situation. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that can have positive impacts on safety as well. Um, so uh, even in the short term when people are trying to figure it out, if the result is that they slow down and take a little extra note, then, then that's probably a good thing. You said it. I, I was going to point out that education can be a really powerful tool. Anytime that you use, not, not just a, a new device, but even a, an old device used in a new way that people in the beginning tend to not understand. But if you, um, if you can provide some education, that could be in the form of, you know, flyering the, the vehicles as they approach, uh, stopping them, teaching them, telling them. Uh, you, you can definitely uh, make that learning curve uh, steeper. All right, thank you. Um, if bike lanes continue into an on-ramp, would that increase the risk of a right hook? Uh, and this, so this is, the, 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 and I assume that's responding to the idea of if a right turn pocket is longer than 200 feet, and so you're going to continue the right turn, the bike lane to the right of a right turn lane for some uh, a distance, and then transition them over. Um, and so if I, I think that's the question, and so all I can say is sort of the same thing that I've said once before, which is we got a group of people together and had this conversation, and that was the consensus view about it. I'd rather have that situation than I would be traveling out between two moving lanes for more than 200 feet. So it's sort of the, what's the, it's, it's the least bad option. Um, I don't necessarily think it increases the risk of the right hook, um, because the right hook's not going to take place until you get closer to the actual turn movement. Uh, but uh, but it, but I, it, it just, if the question is hey where did you get that and then I I completely agree that I actually think that would be a point of potential research either through an NCHRP um, project or something else this is a consensus view of a bunch of really smart people uh, but I don't think this is a terribly well researched topic area okay in some of the uh, the diagrams there were directional area arrows for motor vehicles that need to merge across the bike lane to get to the turn lane. But is there any marking directing the bicyclist to merge left? There, I don't believe so. I mean, I think Mariana made reference once to the use of color, um, uh, which you certainly could use. Um, so you could dash in green, uh, a skip stripe of green, in the areas where the expectation is that either bikes are merging left or the vehicles are merging across cyclists as, as a way to indicate that this is the area where the transition occurs. Uh, uh, generally, the sign that you accompany the companies to the area where the where right turn pocket begins as vehicles yield to bikes. Um, uh, I don't think that I, I. This is a little beyond my knowledge, but I, I don't. I can't think of an accompanying sign uh, that would be used in the case where you're asking the bike to transition uh, from the left and across um, uh, to a, a, from the right side of the road in, into between the, the through and the right turn lane. Um, I think you just define that as a zone, let them make the crossing at the location that is 
revise a gap in traffic for them, but don't try to prescribe a location. And I, I can't think of an accompanying sign, but that's something we could research a little more uh, if, if there's a desire that we do that. Yeah, I would, I would agree with Matthew, and I think this is definitely the situation where if there are additional treatments that you can provide to make clear what movements need to happen, then by all means you should investigate them and introduce them at locations such as that. I think that the conflict points between vehicles and bikes are really good opportunities for, um, for addi additional treatments. And the, the color pavement is certainly an option that we didn't have when we started uh, working on the guide that is now available. But there may be other treatments out there that are not necessarily uh, approved at the federal level, like Matthew explained, but that can be investigated and used. OK. Um, I got several questions that are similar, so I'm going to try to consolidate them into one. Um, with uh, How do you signal an exit ramp to distinguish it from a ramp from a street crossing, uh, particularly when it's a, a street level graded ramp, uh, to be ADA compliant and efficient or uh, uh, usable by uh, the visually impaired? I mean, do you need to put uh, truncated domes, or is there something else, a lip, that you need to install there? So James, are we talking about the exit ramp for cyclists, the, the little ramp that they would, would use? Is that yeah. the question? Or is it, okay. Yeah. yeah, and this is another uh, topic that we had, again, topic of discussion amongst a bunch of smart people, uh, but no really good uh, best practice that we could find. Uh, uh, the, uh, well, actually, the best practices that we did find uh, indicated not to use truncated domes at those locations. The idea being that um, they're away from the intersection a little bit in most cases. Uh, people who are visually impaired wouldn't be finding those. You don't necessarily want to send the signal to a, a person who's visually impaired that uh, this is the point at which you're crossing into traffic. So that in, in the application of the truncated domes might actually confuse the condition even more. And, and visually impaired people might think, oh, this is the crosswalk. Um, uh, so the guidance that we've got, and I also heard Roger Geller uh, in a presentation talking about NACTO a couple weeks ago have a similar recommendation say, um, not to use truncated domes on those ramps. Uh, I think a lip is, is a good idea, although it needs to be a relatively modest lip, um, uh, just uh, from the perspective of not wanting to rattle the cyclists too much. And the ramps that we envision are very similar to the ramps that are recommended for multi-lane roundabouts, too, for the same purpose of, of giving cyclists who might be uncomfortable navigating through that type of a vehicle scenario um, an opportunity to, to exit from it. Good point. All right. Uh, drivers often do, no, do not look right when preparing to make a right turn from a stop condition because they're looking for a gap in traffic from the left. Do you have any suggestions for these cases? Well, I think that's why we've tried to design the intersections to slow vehicles down as much as possible. That's why we design the cases so that the, the, they start with the least um, complex, as, as Mariana said. Uh, and those are the ones that we would err towards. So, I, I, in general, we would say look at the volume thresholds that you're, you are you have forecast for a 20-year forecast to add an interchange and pick the geometric configuration that has the least number has the le is the least complex. Um, uh, uh, but the things that we've identified as as ways to accommodate that or help to offset that concern is uh, is the angle at which the uh, off ramp approaches. Uh, the arterial street, uh, and then the use of appropriate traffic control at those locations. And also any design indications that are going to signal to the driver that you're entering a location that, you're, that pedestrians are going to be expected. Uh, so having that high visibility crosswalk, having a, a buffered sidewalk, um, you know, having street trees, having things that are places where in, in any other urban environment context you're you're going to be at that same type of geometric uh, location, uh, but that you're going to be looking for pedestrians because you would expect pedestrians. OK. It appears the sidewalk width before the bicycle ramp is the same width after the bicycle ramp. What is the recommended sidewalk width with bikes? So we didn't get into that specific issue, I think, during the course of this. And I don't think that we have any specific guidance on, on that issue. Um, although if the comment is that you expect some cyclists to use that, you want to design that as a whip that's more consistent with a multi-use uh, facility, I think that's at your discretion to do so. I think the sign that we would expect to see posted on the arterial is bikes may use sidewalk. 
Um, and so we and, and we did not assume that, that the, the sidewalk width got any wider uh, at that location, but you certainly could. Okay. Would you recommend the requirement of bicyclists riding on the shoulder of the highway, not the arterial crossing the highway, to exit and re-enter instead of crossing the highway on off ramp? And have you seen this done? I would not recommend that. Uh, um, as I said, this, uh, the sign where we generally are uh, in favor of is one that says bikes may use sidewalks, so give it as an option. Um, but my experience, uh, so there's, we were talking a little bit about low stress and 8 to 80 cyclists, which is 8 years to 80 years old, so they're trying to cover the spectrum of, of potential cyclists. Uh, but there's also a spectrum of cyclists who are quite, quite capable. Uh, and do not want to be diverted to a sidewalk and will not divert to a sidewalk. So it's important to accommodate those users as well. Um, and so I, I, uh, I personally would not support a sign that says bikes have to exit the facility and, and use the adjacent sidewalk. All right. Um, you showed an exit ramp for bikes from the bike lane to the sidewalk in all of your examples. Where do you recommend placing the re-entry ramp for cyclists to return to the bike lane? Also, is a wider sidewalk crosswalk recommended in areas where bike pads are sharing space? I don't know, Marianne, if you want to take one of these, or I don't want to hog up the time here. I think we've already talked about the, the width issue, but maybe you talked about the, the on-ramp. We did, and the on-ramp is something that has come up at other times, but we wanted to minimize the opportunities for pedestrians who are visually impaired to take the wrong ramp. And so we just expect that the bicyclist who takes the off-ramp from the arterial is going to use uh, the crosswalk ramps uh, to cross to the other side. We did toss around the idea of providing a, a re-entry ramp, uh, but we decided that, um, that we didn't want to introduce any more ramps than we had to. Well, I think we, I think in some cases we have re-entry ramps. I'm sorry to, um, so in cases where you, you actually need an re-entry ramp to re-enter enter the arterial, I think we have shown that, and I think we've generally shown that as, as close to the intersection as possible, but um, uh, far enough away that it, it won't be confused with an, with a crosswalk. Uh, so I, I, I think that we went through and added that to each of the cases, but I guess we can go back through one more time and make sure that, that bikes always have a chance to get back onto the arterial if they have opted to get off. I think we just Am wanted to verify that? that essentially the okay. bike lane emanates from the crosswalk in, in all of the cases. And so if you're using the crosswalk, you're able to basically, instead of using the, the opposite end of the crosswalk to get on the sidewalk, you can just enter the bike lane from that place. Sure. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense on those cases where that's possible. Yeah, we did check. Okay. Based on the illustrations of the spewies, it looks like bicyclists would also need two phases to cross without conflict. Is that the case? No, they can, they, uh, at least in terms of crossing the on and off ramps, they can use the phase of the signal that, uh, that loses the through vehicles on the, on the, um, on the arterial street. I, I guess if you're saying to cross the streets, then, uh, like to cross across the arterial street, then, then yeah, that would be the case. Uh, and the recommendation would be that they use the same crosswalks as, as the pedestrians are using. Um, uh, and, then, and then the previous comment was, would you then widen crosswalks uh, if you're going to direct bikes to use those? And that's certainly an option to, to be considered. Okay. Well, that is about all the time we have for discussion today. I'm sorry if we did not get to your questions. Once again, a PDF copy of the presentation slides will be available uh, later today at www.walkinginfo.org slash webinars. And a recording of today's program we posted to, to that site as well. Um, you can also find a copy of this recording on our YouTube channel, which is www.youtube.com slash pedbikeinfo. That should be posted within a, a week or two. Uh, and if you follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash pedbike, uh, we will announce when those uh, recordings are available. Finally, I want to remind you that a very brief survey will appear once the webinar is ended. Again, we very much appreciate you taking a moment to complete it. Thank you again to our speakers, Matthew Ridgway, Megan Mittman, and Mariana Pajayas. And thank you to all of you for attending today's PBIC Livable Communities webinar.